In this video, we're going to explore shock waves. We're going to be looking at a few simulations in the next few slides. This is a bird's eye perspective. There are different perspectives on how cues form. I'm going to show you three different simulations. They're from three different perspectives, but it's the same situation. the driver's perspective. I love the cup of coffee. Basically what you see is stop and go traffic. You could have two lanes going through and you have an on-ramp. And even if the flow on those two lanes upstream of the merge or below the capacity of those two lanes, the additional traffic from the on-ramp is enough to tip it so that at that point the demand from all three lanes exceeds the capacity at the bottleneck. Merge ramps are designed to allow vehicles enough speed to accelerate the speed of traffic, but if there's congestion, that may not work well. There are design constraints in a lot of places, of course, because space, space is limited. If the highway engineers had their way, it would be very long, smooth entrance ramps allowing vehicles to get up to full speed without any difficulty. Of course, engineers design for different types of vehicles. The acceleration of a Lamborghini differs from a truck, so there are reference or design vehicles used for acceleration and deceleration ramps. These vehicles are generally not Lamborghinis, and they're usually not designed for trucks either, but for some typical car. However, the ramp is expected to serve many trucks, the truck may also be a design vehicle. From the point of view of an aerial observer, we see it in the same scenario from the top. One of the artifacts is that the cars hop over to the next lane. But you see, sometimes there's a problem. The vehicle accelerates, but there's no gap to move into. This happens in real life. This type of dynamic is one of the things that's causing the problem and drivers may not choose the right gap. They may be saying, well, these cars are going too slow, I'll try to go farther down the entrance ramp. If they go farther down the entrance ramp and no gap appears, then the driver has to slow down because she is facing the end of the entrance ramp, and that can be a problem. Another thing that Minnesotans will do, more than people in other states, is decelerate in the main lane of traffic to allow somebody to merge in. If you're in Washington, D.C., almost no one would ever do that for you. Here, people will do that for you. This is being what's called Minnesota nice. The idea is that the nice driver in the main lane is letting somebody in without thinking that she is being mean to all the people behind her because her act of kindness is delaying them by letting the on-ramp vehicle merge. But she's not dealing with the people behind her. She is dealing, in a sense, face-to-face -face with the person next to her. We're going to model shock waves. You see shock waves are a cascade of brake lights, the red lights for the back of cars. There are a variety of causes. We showed one. It could be a physical uh, freeway on-ramp. It could be a change in capacity, a drop in the number of lanes. It could be a change in capacity because of a change in grade. Some vehicles, particularly trucks, can't accelerate very well, or if the hill is steep, even maintain speed going uphill. As a result of not being able to maintain speed, a larger and larger gap opens up in front of trucks, which is wasting capacity and thus effectively reducing the amount of throughput on the roadway. Traffic signals are an obvious source, or ramp meter lights as well. What's happening here is the maximum flow is dropping from C1 to C2. As the capacity drops, speed drops. We talked about QK curves. This is the fundamental diagram, the relationship between speed, flow, and density. For graphing flow on the y-axis, the number of vehicles per hour, and the density on the x-axis, the number of vehicles per kilometer, the speed is the slope of the line, phi is over run, vehicles per hour over vehicles per kilometer. Speed is measured in kilometers per hour. So speed on the left-hand side of the curve is constant because it is a straight line up to that inflection, and inflection is the point at which capacity is reached. Up until capacity is reached, drivers can drive at free flow speed. This is an idealization, of course. At or just below capacity, speeds begin to drop. Once capacity is reached, flow or throughput is fixed, but the speed drops and the density increases until some point at which you can't even achieve the maximum throughput because the speed is so low that the length of the vehicle becomes a relevant issue. 
at low speeds, high densities, the ability of the vehicle to go past a point at a given speed becomes critical and throughput begins to drop. This is an empirical curve. It's been reproduced empirically. There's a lot of data for it. The exact points at which speeds drop or capacity is achieved at throughput drops are all empirical questions. They depend on the drivers in your population. As traffic becomes more congested, it becomes more orderly in one sense as the spacing between vehicles becomes more uniform. But it becomes less orderly in another sense as speeds become more variable with stop and start conditions. These empirical results depend on road conditions, the physical layout of the road, the grade of the road, the number of lanes, whether they're on ramps and off ramps and things like that. Consider a bottleneck, for instance, a lane drop. We expect the capacity to drop. At the bottleneck, the maximum throughput is reduced. So there are two QK curves, one for the upstream section and one for the downstream section. Some combination of flow, density, and speed for the upstream condition, what happens downstream? You have different optimal maximum capacity and optimal density downstream. Traffic essentially has to slow down. It gets denser. You get less throughput. Basically, keep in mind that these are the two QK curves that we're dealing with. Let's start off with Q1. Now, Q1 is not at capacity upstream. You're below capacity upstream, but it's above capacity downstream. Since it's above the capacity downstream, you can't get more than Q2 vehicles past the downstream point. You wind up, instead of being at free flow speed on the upstream curve, the downstream curve, you're at maximum capacity at higher density and lower speed. Downstream your capacity, this constrains the effective upstream throughput. It is not possible to get more than Q2 vehicles past the bottleneck once they have to slow down. Just to illustrate the point with simple numbers, Let's say the downstream capacity is 1,000 vehicles an hour, while upstream, if we're unconstrained, could serve 2,000 vehicles an hour. As those 2,000 vehicles an hour approach the bottleneck, only 1,000 are getting discharged through. The queue grows up to 1,000 vehicles longer each hour if the upstream section had been operating capacity. 1,000 vehicles an hour is a lot. Hopefully, it's not that bad. For instance, we assume that demand isn't responding to this. We're assuming that demand is given. Imagine, for instance, it's sudden and a surprise. This is a crash, and people weren't expecting it, so the capacity drop takes place in the middle of rush hour. But everybody's already started at that point. In that case, the demand for the section is largely fixed. Some people may try to change routes, assuming they get information about the incident. We project out the Q2 line onto the QK, upstream QK curve. Then we draw a line between this point, which is projected here, and the point where Q1 and K1 intersect on the upstream curve. That green line represents the shock wave speed. That's how fast the shock wave, the point at which people start braking, moves backwards. Notice that the regular speed has a positive slope because traffic is moving forwards. The shock wave is going in the opposite direction. The line of cars is getting longer at the tail in the opposite direction of traffic. Upstream, instead of operating at a density of K1, you're now operating at a density of K2. Now, K2 is significantly higher than K1, and instead of Operating at free flow speed, you're operating at this lower speed determined by the purple line. What you have is a downstream section. Traffic is moving with a particular speed and a particular density. There's a wave boundary, which is moving in the upstream direction. An upstream section where people are going at higher speed and a lower density. Upstream, a driver is happily moving along until she encounters a wave of brake lights. Then she has to slow down. The traffic compresses and continues to move forward. But this point at which they have to slow down and compress is moving backward in space. That's the physics of what's going on. Now we'll talk about the math of what's going on. We have flow rates in two sections. We call them Q sub 1 and Q sub 2. Q equals KV. Q sub 1 equals K sub 1 times V sub 1. Q sub 2 equals K sub 2 times V sub 2. The difference in flows equals the shockwave speed times the difference in densities. Thus, the shockwave speed equals the difference in flows over the difference in densities. Q equals K times V. The shockwave speed is delta Q over delta K. That's the slope of the green line in the previous figure. 
this is the most important of these equations, q equals kv, which means that v equals q over k. Shockwave speed equals the difference of q over the difference in k. Just keep that in mind. It's a definition, essentially. To think about what's going on, it makes sense. We have a relative speed, which is the difference in speed in the upstream area from the shockwave speed, v sub 1 minus v sub w. And in the downstream area, the relative speed, v sub r2, is v sub 2 minus v sub w. Again, this is a definition. You're just looking at the relative speed, comparing the speed in two places. The speed is moving backwards, and you're moving forwards. The relative speed is higher. Imagine two cars are both driving at 120 kilometers an hour. In the same direction, they don't collide. One's driving at 121 kilometers an hour, and one's driving at 119 kilometers an hour in the same lane. And the slower car is in front. They will collide, but the difference in speed is very small. It's only two kilometers an hour. So hopefully not a lot of damage is done. If two cars are driving at 120 kilometers per hour in the same lane in the opposite direction, the speed of collision is 240 kilometers per hour, and both passengers will die. Both cars collide very, very fast. So the relative speed is moving against the traffic. The shockwave speed is negative. V sub 2 minus a negative number is making that number much bigger. If we know this, we can also figure out the number of vehicles per hour at a point. Q is the vehicles per hour. If you want to know the number of vehicles, you multiply that by the number of hours, and that gives you the number of vehicles. Q equals K times V, N equals K times V times a time period. We're trying to figure out how many people are crossing from the upstream area to the downstream area over a time period. You need to think about the relative speed, because the shock wave is moving backwards against the forward moving traffic. If you have N sub 1, the number of vehicles crossing from area 1 to area 2 equals v sub r1 times k sub 1 times the period of interest. If we said 1 hour, then t equals 1. Note, because of conservation of flow, the number of vehicles going from area 1 to area 2 is the same as the number of vehicles that are coming to, into area 2 from area 1. So n sub 2 crossing, just measuring from the other side, is v sub r2 times k sub 2 times t. Since n sub 1 has to equal n sub 2 because of conservation of flow, if you're crossing from left to right and we look at you from the left or downstream side, it's the same as if we look at you from the right or upstream side. In short, v sub w equals delta q over delta k. Here's a problem. Traffic flow on a highway denoted as q sub 1 equals 2,000 vehicles per hour. Vehicles are driving at a speed of 80 kilometers an hour. As a result of a crash, the road is blocked. The density in the queue is 275 vehicles per kilometer, which is very, very high. We're assuming vehicle lengths of 3.63 meters. The question is, what is the wave speed? And what is the rate at which the queue grows in units of vehicles per hour, Q? So remember, Q equals K times V. V sub W equals delta Q over delta K. First thing we need to do is identify the unknowns. We were given q sub 1 equals 2,000 vehicles per hour, and v sub 1 equals 80 kilometers per hour. So k sub 1 equals 25 vehicles per kilometer. So solve the video, solve for the rest. OK. We were told that the road was blocked, so the cars come to a stop. So v sub 2 equals 0 and q sub 2 equals 0. Logically, k sub 2 is undefined. But here we are told k sub 2 is jam density, which is given as 275 vehicles per kilometer. k sub 1 was 25 vehicles per kilometer, q sub 2 was 0, q sub 1 is 2,000. So we have a wave speed of 8 kilometers per hour going backwards, just justifying a negative sign. The q is growing against traffic. What is the rate at which the q grows in terms of vehicles per hour? So 
we're looking for n sub 1 or n sub 2, and that's v sub 1 minus v sub w times k sub 1 times t, and let t equal 1. And we can substitute in q sub 1 minus v sub w times k sub 1 equals q sub 2 minus v sub w times k sub 2. q sub 1 equals 2,000, v sub 1 equals minus 8, k sub 1 equals 25, and that equals 2,200 vehicles per hour.